You're listening to episode 192, Why Letting Things Be Easy Feels Hard. You're listening to the Inner Boss Podcast. I'm your host, Jen Casey. I'm a business strategy and master mindset coach for online coaches who are ready to grow and scale profitable, purpose-driven businesses. This show is all about bringing you the business strategy and spiritual psychology to help you awaken your vision, trust the process, and take inspired action. Let's get into the show. Today, we are addressing the question, can it be easy? And when I say it, I am talking about all the things in your business that you are making really hard, that feel heavy and stressful and produce anxiety. Can it be easy? We're talking about launches and sales and creating content and outsourcing and hiring a team. Can it be easy? So I started talking to the women inside my paid programs, my mastermind, my group coaching program, about this idea, about this question. Can it be easy? Will you allow it to be easy? What would it look like if it was easy? And from this question, many conversations have been born around the way in which we show up and the rules that we have about how we should quote unquote be showing up. And so I felt really called to record this episode to really unpack the pattern of thoughts and questions that I'm starting to see come up around this question. So in asking this question, can it be easy? I started to notice certain patterns that were arising. And one of the objections, you might call it, or areas of resistance that I was getting from certain individuals was, well, maybe it can be easy in the future, but right now it can't be easy because I have to launch or I have to get sales because I don't have the money and I'm in this place of total scarcity. And I said, hold on, wait a minute, let's take a moment to really look at this, to really understand this. And what we uncovered is that the money issues was a physical manifestation of a behavior, of only taking action when there's scarcity and survival and anxiety. And that is being motivated by a belief. And that belief is some version or variation of, I have to work hard to make money, right? So we're gonna unpack this layer by layer, peel back this onion, and then really start to uncover some of the other secondary questions that may come up due to this belief. Now, as you're listening to this, I want you to know that I am basing this off of real life examples. So if I share something that doesn't totally completely align with your personal situation, that's okay. Take what does work, leave behind what doesn't, and do your own personal exploration. Now, if you're listening to this and you're sitting there saying, well, Jen, I'm not dealing with these issues at all. That's okay because you're going to be able to see how we can walk it back in three steps by number one, seeing that individual's specific outcome or result or problem that they're experiencing, finding layer two, the actual behavior that is creating that result, and then going back to number three, which is the belief that is motivating that behavior that is creating that result, right? So going back. When I asked, can it be easy? Like I said, the issue was, well, I have money problems. I don't have the money right now, so I wish it could be easy or I think it might be able to be easy in the future, but right now it can't be easy because I just don't have the money. And so that's bringing this individual back into scarcity so that they have to launch or they have to sell or they have to take some kind of action. And when it shows up in that way, a question we wanna ask is, is this a pattern? If it's a pattern, it may very well be this individual's motivation strategy. Maybe when they were in high school or college, they were the person that waited until the absolute last minute to write their papers or study for a big exam. Where else is this pattern showing up in their life? Now, what's interesting about this is not only is this their motivation strategy, this is also a part of their coping strategy, this layer of procrastination, right? They're using this avoidance mechanism, not for the intention of self-sabotage, which is what most people think, but instead to achieve a certain positive outcome, whether that be an emotion or some kind of result. In this case, it could be a feeling of safety or some kind of stress avoidance. It could be any number of things. 
but I think this survival mode situation is a very interesting pairing of coping to avoid stress, as well as motivating to get a certain result. Meaning that even though it's a maladaptive behavior that is creating some chaos and some negative emotion and experiences, there's also what is called a secondary gain or a benefit, in this case two very clear and I'm sure more benefits that this individual is getting from holding on to this pattern. So how is it that somebody is manifesting money issues so that they are in such a place of scarcity that they have to take action? Well, it could be any number of things, right? To achieve this, we might do things like overspending. Or I had one client telling me that she wasn't financially stable and they weren't going to be able to make the bills. And I asked her for more information about the numbers so we could set some goals. And in having that conversation, she shared with me that she actually hadn't checked her numbers in a really long time. So she was in that place of avoidance where she didn't even want to look at it. Lo and behold, when she looked at it, things were actually a lot better, a lot better than she thought they were. So in avoiding it, she was actually creating a lot more pain for herself. Another way could be not showing up online or in your business. That's the hiding, the escape to avoid. Or posting a little bit. Not getting on my video, not doing the things that you really know are going to move the needle, but just posting enough. And that's just like partial avoidance where we can escape that responsibility by saying, well, I tried and it just didn't work and it's not my fault. See, look at these posts that I made. I tried. Mm -hmm. Or some of you guys might not even realize this is one of them, but not taking care of ourselves and then not feeling well or feeling tired or sick or my body hurts, right? And then we could just blame it on this ailment. I couldn't show up for my lunch. I had to push it back because I just wasn't feeling good, right? Our ego can really find creative ways to talk us out of our greatness, to find ways to keep us small. And for me, what's super interesting about this is that this is simply a symptom. This is a symptom, a result that we are getting based on behaviors that we are doing over and over again, some kind of action, which is being motivated by a belief, by a belief. So we now know what the result is. So what is the behavior? Well, the behavior is that we are only taking action when we are in scarcity and fear or that survival mode, that anxiety. When we look at what motivates someone, we see two ends of the spectrum. Those individuals who are motivated by pain and those who are motivated by pleasure. Now, unfortunately, most people are motivated primarily and almost exclusively by pain. Not everyone, but there are many people that that is their primary driver. What I found for being around a lot of very successful entrepreneurs is that they are actually very motivated by pleasure and not saying that they always were. They've trained themselves and hardwired themselves to be motivated by pleasure instead of being motivated by pain. And if you're sitting there going, what do you mean, Jen? Let's think about taxes. All year long, people, entrepreneurs alike, put off keeping track of their bookkeeping or put off doing their taxes until the month, the week, maybe even a few days before the deadline. And they might even be that person that files for an extension because for them, Previously, there was a lot of pain about looking at their numbers. There was a lot of pain about getting everything together and sending it off to the accountant before they could procrastinate. And it was really stress avoidance. It was stressful for them to do this thing. And so they were avoiding stress by putting it off. But the more that they put it off, the pain actually flipped. So this is somebody who's operating from pain versus pain instead of pain versus pleasure. So previously it was pain to do the activity And now, after a certain timeline, it's more painful to avoid the activity. And so those individuals then take action. And this is a pattern that we see across the board with entrepreneurs, especially when we are being challenged as business owners to step forward and do things that are uncomfortable, that are new. We are saying, will we sit in the pain of what we know? Or will we step out into the unknown, which we could then fill in, is probably potentially painful because we don't know what the heck we're doing. So there's going to be some mistakes and some hiccups and all the things. So we're going pain versus pain, pain versus pain. And so this is the behavior. This is the physical manifestation 
of a much deeper issue, right? So what is the belief that is motivating this behavior? It is some version or variation of, I have to work hard to make money. This idea that hard work equals financial success. Especially for those individuals who were brought up in the United States, this belief is so deeply ingrained in our culture, in our society, and in our subconscious minds, because this is what we are told from such a young age. Now, what I find interesting about this belief, you have to work hard to make money, is that there are slight variations for each individual person. And so I asked recently to a few people in my audience, how do you define hard work? We have this belief that hard work equals money, but how are we even defining hard? So what is hard work? Is it the length of hours you work? Is it the intention behind the work? Is it how much you stretched your brain or your body beyond what you thought it was capable of? Is it how much you sweat? How miserable it was? How much anxiety you felt during it? The two that I saw come up the most, now this was a small pool of people I asked, but the ones I saw come up the most was how much you worked, how busy you were, that busy was the badge of honor. And busy could mean the number of hours you worked, but especially for entrepreneurs, you could work six hours, but then spend the rest of your day kind of casually on your phone, scrolling Instagram and thinking about the new things you need to work on. So there's no real off switch when you've got your own business. You've got to be the one to be in command and control of the off switch. You have to be very intentional about that. Otherwise, you could fixate on it all day, every day. As my fiance likes to say, Jen, the office is now closed. <laughs> there was one day where he came over to my computer and started shutting it because I was like, we're going to watch a movie. He's like, Jen, come on, we're going to watch a movie. I was like, yeah, yeah, like two more minutes, just one more sec, one more sec. He's like, the office is now closed. The office is closed. You said, you said, you told me. So that is now what I joke around about, like the office is now closed. Okay, yes, I have permission to close the computer and officially say that today is complete. But I also know how much I struggled with that and how many people, friends of mine, clients of mine, mentors of mine have also struggled with that, right? When you're your own boss, you make all the rules. It's like, ah, did I do enough? Was it enough? Did I, do I deserve to make money from this amount of work that I did? And so it was really interesting to me to see that, it, like I said, it was the length of time and how busy you were was how a lot of people were defining hard work. And then the other most common one that I was seeing was this idea of that we're not supposed to enjoy our work. And of course, when you have your own business, there are things that you might not enjoy doing in the beginning that need to get done. But I'm not talking about that because that has an end game. That has an end goal of you outsourcing and then bringing on people who do like doing those things and you eventually primarily focusing on your zone of genius. What these people were saying was that you have to work hard to make money, meaning you have to consistently do things that you don't like doing in order for you to deserve that money. In those conversations, a lot of those individuals didn't even realize how layered these subconscious beliefs actually were. And I think what's so interesting about the belief hard work equals money is how people will hold on to this belief even though there's a whole lot of contradictory evidence. I don't know about you guys, but before I had a successful business, I had some other side hustles and some other gigs that I did. I spent eight years as a bartender and server at a TGI Fridays. And I also worked at this hole in the wall. I mean, truly hole in the wall place called Fatties. And um, yeah, those shifts went to like four in the morning, didn't get home till six. I also did some catering thereafter and worked for a DJ company where I was initially hired to be a motivational dancer at like bot and bar mitzvahs to like get the kids up and going. And I was supposed to know like the dances that were happening at that time. And I really did not. I was making stuff up. The kids knew it better than me. It wasn't a good look, but I thought that was a pretty cool gig. And then all of a sudden they'd be like, hey, can you come and do this gig where you're going to be on snow cone machine duty? Or can you come and face paint? And I was open to it, even though I was paid very little because I was building my business. And I was like, all right, I'm going to take this money. I'm going to reinvest it into a course or a program or a coach or a live event. And there was one day in particular. You want to talk about hard work equals money? Okay. 
probably got paid about 50 bucks for this entire experience, we'll call it. So one day they said, we've got this gig, and I thought I was going to do snow cones or face painting or something. So they're like, this is for a school fair for an elementary slash middle school. And when I got there, they said, oh, by the way, you're actually going to be on the cotton candy machine. Do you know how to work the cotton candy machine? I said, no. They said, oh, no worries. It's super easy. You guys, I don't know if you've ever seen a cotton candy machine. It's fairly straightforward, but the one they had was not very functional. So let me explain. Basically, the way that the machine works is there's like this core center area where you pour pure sugar. When you flip one of the switches, it heats up that sugar. The other switch takes that circle tube thing and it spins it around and that's what turns the pure sugar into the cotton candy substance. And there's also this like plastic thing that goes around that helps to catch any flyaway pieces of cotton candy. Now, as the person working the machine, it's your job to make sure that you capture all of this great cotton candy in the perfect timing so that it doesn't get burned or it doesn't get stuck on the walls of the machine. So you've got to have all of these little cone shaped pieces of paper ready to go. You got to keep your arm nice L shape parallel to the floor, nice 90 degree, and you gotta bend your wrist. And in that hand, you've got one of those cone-shaped pieces of paper, and you gotta go in a circle and twist your hand at the same time. You gotta keep twirling, twirling it all around to capture all that cotton candy. Now, your arm fatigues a lot faster than you might think it's going to. And to make it worse, I'm so short, I'm 5'1", I needed a step stool to use that machine to be really honest, right? That's why my angle of my arm was so high up. I was in a serious isometric cold. Thank goodness at that time I was really into fitness because I wouldn't have made it. In my current state, I wouldn't have made it, guys. I'm just keeping it real with you. Like my hand and wrist dexterity, twirling the paper with the tubes and the cotton candy, I, don't, I wouldn't wish that on anyone. And what's funny is you might be sitting there thinking, oof, that's rough. That's not even the bad part. This is a gym filled with all grades of elementary school kids who are given access to free sugar. They can come up as many times as they want. Okay. I thought my bartending crowd was rowdy and demanding. I was not prepared. I was not prepared. <laughs> I was just not. And since the machine is crap and the sugar burns so easily and I'm trying to quickly get all these pieces of cone paper out. They're all like stacked up. I'm trying to unstick them. I would often have to shut down the machine to clean out the burnt sugar and to clean the sides and then to refill it while the angry mob of sugar-induced children was quickly building. At the end of that particular day, I was completely covered, head to toe covered in sugar. Because when you pour the sugar into the spinny thing, the sugar most of it turns into cotton candy, but some of it just sprays out and hits you straight in the face, like BB gun pellets, like really, really small pellets, and just lodges itself into your pores. So all of my clothes covered in sugar, my hair covered in sugar and strands of cotton candy, my glasses, sheet of sugar, I could barely see out of them, looks like I've just bedazzled my arms or sprayed myself with like 1999 glitter, I don't know. I was not prepared. I was not prepared. And this doesn't even count the long drives to these locations. This one in particular was like 45 minutes away. The setup, lugging heavy equipment into these spaces, then doing this really long shift with crazy children everywhere, and my arm is killing me, and then deconstructing, and then loading all this equipment into the car. Sometimes they didn't have room. They didn't have room in their van for like the snow cone machine or the cotton candy machine. So they'd be like, Jen, you keep it in your car and just drop it off at the warehouse tomorrow. Whatever, whatever time works for you. For $50. The whole gig, $50. Like, this is the shit I did while I was building my business part-time to have more money to reinvest in my business. And thank goodness I stuck with it and today I have built my business to an amazing place where I make a whole lot more money and work a whole lot less physically hard. But there was also a lot that I had to personally go through to create these boundaries for the crappy jobs and really get to the place where I made the decision that I was no longer going to spend my time or really waste my time doing things like this. Like when you actually crunch the numbers and say, okay, that was like 11 hours of work for $50. What did I really make? Oh God, I don't even want to know. I don't even want to do the math, right? 
Maybe you've had an experience like that before. That shit was hard. That shit was hard on so many levels. It was physically hard. It was emotionally hard. Spiritually. Oh my God. Soul sucking, right? And it paid shit. So there wasn't even (laughs) financial benefit. So this whole idea of hard work equals financial success. I'm not buying it. I have so much evidence and so do you that shows you otherwise. But from this very, very tricky belief comes sub-beliefs. And one of them is this idea, since I work hard, I deserve to make money. And this one might even be more tricky than hard work equals financial success. Since I work hard, I deserve to make money. Now, I pretty much always, since I was a kid, had this identity of being a hard worker. And... I wore it as a badge of honor. Like I thought, I'm a hard worker. This is what makes me valuable. This is what allows me to deserve this money. But on another level or another layer of my mind, I knew I deserved more for the labor intensive and emotionally taxing work of dealing with other people and or other people's children that you are not choosing. That's one of my favorite things about having my own business is that I get to attract and choose people that align with me. When you are a bartender or a waitress or working for a DJ company, you don't know who you're about to interact with and you don't have a choice. So you really need to get good at a poker face and customer support. You need those two. Absolutely necessary, (laughs) right? But back when I was building my business, for me, really the hardest thing would have been staying in a job that gave me no fulfillment versus the heart of leaving right? Because both are hard. This is, again, coming back to this pain versus pleasure. This is pain versus pain. It's hard for me to stay where I am, but it's also hard for me to leave. And I was in a place at my job at TGI Fridays. It was, it was Easter of 2014. When I finally put my foot down, I hit my threshold. I had my moment of insight and I realized that staying there was actually harder than the unknown and potential challenges that I might face. In business, especially in the last couple of years, this lesson has appeared again and again, as they do and as they will for all of us. This was in a different form with, do I hire and train a team or do I do it all myself? Now I'm gonna be real with you. In the beginning, I tried to do it all myself because I'm a hard worker. Hard work equals success, I got this. But as things kept growing, it became impossible to have it all on my shoulders. And I started burning out faster and feeling more resentful of my business and frustrated. And it became harder to continue to do it all myself versus challenge myself with venturing into learning things that were completely new. And I think a gift that I've given myself, a mantra that I've had, is give yourself permission to be a beginner. Give yourself grace to be a beginner. Permission to be a beginner. Permission to not have it figured out. So as we're talking through this and unpacking it, I want you to come back and ask yourself that question again of how are you defining hard? Is it the length of time that you're working? Is it how overworked or stressed you are? Is it how little sleep you've gotten? Is it how much you've sacrificed your own self-care? Like skipping a shower for four days to finish a webinar final might have been a badge of honor. But what if prioritizing daily hygiene practices and also doing great work made you feel that same pride, that same excitement, that same feeling of accomplishment? I spent so much time, so long attached to how I was such a good hard worker and my whole life I had gotten all this positive reinforcement for being a hard worker to the point where I remember getting really excited when I heard Will Smith on a talk show. He said that he attributed his success to being such a hard worker and being able to outwork other people because you could put him and somebody else on a treadmill and he was either going to be on there longer or he was going to die. And his whole thing was like not giving up and staying in the long game. And I interpreted that as he's a hard worker. Look at him. He doesn't stop. He's relentless. That's me too. And that was what I chose to identify with. 
the real challenge, the real hard for me was letting go of the idea and the belief that things had to be hard. The real challenge was learning how to let things be easy, letting things align, letting myself feel joyful in the work, not resistant and stressful. What is easy? What does that even mean? Now, of course, easy could mean a multitude of things. However, when I have conversations with people about this idea of letting it be easy, there's usually two end results or two visual like manifestations of what they think it's going to look like. So the first one that I hear a lot is doing nothing to get a sale in the sense of having passive income, having some kind of funnel where people are just buying from you on a daily basis, which we know can be built. Okay, so that's one version of easy. The second version of easy that I'm hearing a lot of people talk about a lot is being able to feel joyful in the process of creation with no resistance, which we also know can be experienced. So how are you defining easy and why aren't you allowing yourself to receive some version of this? Let me say that one more time. How are you defining easy and why aren't you allowing yourself to receive some version of this? Now, maybe you're saying, Jen, I do allow myself to receive some version of this. Okay, awesome. I'm so happy to hear that. That makes me genuinely so happy (laughs) to hear that people are building their businesses in a way that feels good and aligned and joyful and happy. Because the more that we can all show up in that way, the more that we can help and serve others. And I know that that's exactly what you are here to do. Now, if you're in that place where you're saying it feels easy right now, okay, is there another level to that? Not to take anything away from what you've already created. It's just like, what else is possible? What is the next level? What would enhance this even more? Hey, I have a question for you. Have you been struggling to effectively coach your clients? or simply feel like it's time to add another tool to your coaching toolbox, I've got something special just for you. I created a free coaching technique guide that breaks down exactly how to reframe the 12 most common limiting beliefs so that you can facilitate faster breakthroughs for your clients. You can download it now for free over at heyjencasey.com slash guide. Again, heyjencasey.com slash guide, and I'm going to link that up for you in the show notes. On the other side of this is the individual who truly believes I cannot get things done, I cannot be productive unless I am completely overwhelmed and stressed and out of my mind. Let me ask you something. If this is you, is making it hard by stressing yourself out actually what creates a result? Let me say that again. Is making it hard by stressing yourself out actually what creates a result or is it that you stop procrastinating and actually do the work to get it done gut punch a little bit maybe okay so then let me ask you this how much better would the work be if you didn't get yourself into a survival state of fight or flight in order to do your work what would be possible what could you create How could you show up as a leader for your audience, for your clients, for your customers, if you showed up from a place of alignment? What's interesting about this is you've simply conditioned your brain and body to work primarily under these conditions of fight or flight, of survival. So yes, for some people, when they make the conscious decision to change that habitual pattern, to change that conditioning, and they start to implement things like creating a plan, starting earlier, getting support from a team. Something that I've heard from a lot of people is that they'll be in the middle of the launch and they'll have downtime because they've done all of the right things to plan ahead and have a system and have a structure and everything's going really well, and they start to panic because they're like, I don't know what's happening. I feel like I should be doing something. I'm not doing enough. But that simply comes back to the belief that hard work equals financial success. And maybe in that specific situation, that specific example, that individual 
has never experienced a launch or that type of circumstance where they didn't have their entire calendar filled from front to back until 2 a.m. And so it's going to feel a little different. The challenge is not deciding that it's a bad thing or that you're not doing enough or that something's wrong. The opportunity here is to really allow yourself to calibrate essentially to this new way of being, to this new work style, to these new belief systems. By doing less and allowing more in, you begin to retrain your brain to operate differently. Of course, in addition to this, what sometimes comes up during this process is, if it's so easy, do I really deserve it? If it's so easy, I don't feel like I deserve it. Do I deserve it? And the more that we unpack this, we can just see this pattern of how these questions, these thought patterns link right back to hard work equals financial success. That I am not worthy unless I am working hard, that I am rewarded by pain, that I am motivated by pain, and that if I'm not overworked and stressed, then I don't deserve it. And something that I've had a few clients say to me is, I don't want my audience to see me not working. What will they think of me? They're going to think that I'm lazy. They're going to think that I don't deserve it. And I'm like, wait a second. Wait a second. Why would you want your audience to only see you working? Especially for those individuals in the coaching world, someone who's hiring you is usually choosing to work with you and invest with you because you are modeling a certain way of being, modeling a certain life, certain habits that they want to adopt. And so if you are modeling that the only way to achieve success is to burn yourself out and overwhelm yourself, chances are, number one, you're not going to attract as many people as you can. And number two, the people who you do attract are going to be people who also operate from this belief system, who think that you have to work hard in order to make money, right? (laughs) Because they're seeing you model it and that's their version of success. And so by showing up constantly for your audience to make sure that they know that you are working all day, every day, you're actually doing them a total disservice. It's actually your responsibility and part of your job, your role as the coach to figure out better, more effective ways to get the result without having to do all of this stuff that brings down your energy, that pulls down your vibration. Because as you already know from this conversation, hard work, more time, more energy does not equal success. Money is a reflection of the value that you provide, which is actually just another belief, but a much better belief, right? And that's on the 3D level, 3D physical plane level, that money is a reflection of the value you provide. If you're an entrepreneur, business owner, how do you solve a bigger problem or how do you solve it more efficiently for your audience? right? That's a way to become more valuable. If you're in a job and you want to raise, add more value to your service. Help that business or company make more money or solve a problem for them that they haven't been able to solve. Now, of course, I am speaking on the 3D level. You guys know, probably from my plant medicine episodes, I am all in on metaphysics, quantum physics. And so I'm going to offer another belief to you and it's that money is energy and so if you want to attract more money regardless of what else happens you need to align with the vibration of money and if you want to know what vibration you're currently holding around money simply look at how much money you've been attracting we are a mirror of our own thoughts and beliefs and all of our thoughts and beliefs have a vibrational frequency to them that we put out there this is law of attraction law of vibration law of action i'll do a whole part two other podcast episode all about that because there is so much more to unpack there. We will put a pause on the woo for the moment. We will come back to that. Kind of piggybacking on this idea or this question. If it is easy, do I deserve it? What seems to be coming out of that question is, well, if it doesn't happen the first time, like if I decide that I'm going to let this be easy and I'm going to flow with this and I don't get the result, does it prove that I have to work hard? And the other side to this question is, if it does happen easily, is it a fluke? Is it real? 
is it real money? <laughs> I've had people be like, it's fun money. It's fake money. I'm like, what? You're holding it in your hand, boo. And really, this is just a result of cognitive dissonance, a term used in psychology that is defined as the state of having inconsistent thoughts, beliefs, or attitudes, especially as relating to behavioral decisions and attitude changes. And this is simply what happens when we have two beliefs, like money is easy to come by, you have to work hard to make money. As you're building that new belief and eradicating that old belief, I almost see it as like the two beliefs are like bumping up against each other, right? They're, they're having a bro fight. They're, they're bumping their chest. They're like, you want to mess? You want to start? Let's go. Let's go, right? One is trying to overcome the other. And really all that is happening in our brains is we've got these neural pathways where we've created these patterns of thought. And so we just need to build, quote unquote, build the muscle of that pattern simply through repetition. And we can weaken that old belief system by not allowing ourselves to repeat that pattern, breaking that pattern when we start to get into that thinking, challenging that belief by looking for evidence and other examples where that is actually not true, and just continuing to do this work, right? Both of these questions come back to these new beliefs being challenged by these old belief systems. And the challenge that I want to give you if you're having these thoughts and these questions come up is to one, journal around these. Really start to play with your own psyche and start to challenge and unpack and define what things mean to you and when you first decided these things. Where did these belief systems get originated? Because they weren't yours. You didn't come into this physical reality having a belief that hard work equals money. That's something that you learned and modeled over time. And so if we can kind of extract that source and challenge that source of the information, it'll allow you to make a more empowered decision as an adult. Think about your brain like a computer. When we want something like an application on our phone to work more efficiently, we go into the app store and we hit what? Update app. We've got to update the programming. And our brain is a network in itself, a neural network that is being fired and wired and information is being sent and zipped all over the place. And so I think what's so powerful in what I love to teach and talk about is really just giving you back your own power to see that you are fully in control of the thoughts that you think. It's simply about first and foremost, understanding how it all works, (laughs) where it's all coming from, so that you can then go in and intentionally make these changes. I would invite you to journal around some of these questions and these things that come up. One, to really understand some of the thought processes that are happening in your subconscious that you might not be consciously aware of. That's why they're in your subconscious. And also to really start to acknowledge some of the questions that you're asking yourself. Questions are so incredibly powerful. Whatever we ask, we get an answer. And a lot of times we'll ask questions like, what if this is a fluke? What if it doesn't work? And we start going down this negative spiral simply because of a question that we asked ourselves. And so in order to shift ourselves into upward spirals of more empowered vibrations, more empowered emotions, we want to ask more empowered questions. And so that's a fun exercise that I want to leave you with today as you maybe sit down and journal about some of the things that we talked about to really better understand your money story and your work and hard work story and really ask yourself, can it be easy? And the answer is yes. So a better question is, what would it look like if it was easy? What would it look like if it was easy? So that is what I want to leave you with today. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. Please feel free to take a screenshot of the show and tag me on your Instagram stories. I would love to hear your biggest aha, your biggest breakthrough around this conversation. And actually, this week, it's my birthday. I turned 31 on February 4th. And so if you would like to help me celebrate my birthday, it would be really super awesome if you would head to Apple Podcasts, click on search, type in Inner Boss Podcast, find me there, and go ahead and leave a five-star rating interview. That would be the greatest birthday present ever to get to hear from you how the show has impacted you, what your biggest ahas and takeaways have been from listening to the show. That would seriously mean the world to me. And I just want you to know that I really, truly, deeply appreciate you taking the time to listen to this show. I know there are so many amazing podcasts out there, so the fact that you are here with me 
is something that I do not take lightly. I deeply appreciate it. And of course, getting to hear some of the feedback from you, especially you guys sending me messages about the ayahuasca podcast and sharing with me that my singing on those episodes really touched you. Like, OMG, I was crying. Tears of joy and gratitude. You don't even know. Like, it just means the world to me. So thank you so much for being here, for being part of our little pod squad. I appreciate you. And I cannot wait to see you in the next episode. Talk soon. Bye. Did you enjoy this episode? The best way to show some love is to leave a review on iTunes or take a screenshot of the show and tag me on your Instagram at HeyJenCasey. And I'll leave you with this. When you upgrade your expectations, you uplevel your entire life. You're as ready as you'll ever be, so go out there and take some messy, inspired action.